Steve, I want to begin with your first dive into the medtech world, which was as president and chief operating officer at Stryker in 2003, yes. right? And so you were coming in to work under the CEO, John Brown, who had been there since the 70s. And sort of the plan was a planned succession up to the chief executive office for you. So I'm wondering, what was it like to step into a brand new industry at such a, a senior level with such expectations on your shoulders? Sure. It was, I was completely unqualified for the job. If you go through and think about what they were looking for to replace Dre, they wanted somebody with medical device experience, ideally somebody with orthopedic experience, and you know probably somebody older and certainly wiser than I was, and instead, uh, I was 39 years old, I'd never spent a day in medical devices in my life, and I couldn't spell orthopedics. Um, but uh, somehow, John Brown, who built Stryker, and for those of you who've been around this industry for a long time, know what an incredible leader he was, he took a bet on me, and uh, he recruited me. He had literally, when he joined Stryker in 1977, it was $17 million in revenue. So Scott McCafferty, your program here, it was 17 million in revenue. By the time he left and I came in, it was over $3 billion in revenue. So he built it through that time. And I took that job of following a legend, which is always really hard, but uh, we actually did a, uh, a really nice job with it. And uh, you know, he set me up for success beautifully. And I did what I usually do and had a bunch of good people around me and try to get you know focused on the goals. and. You know, it's a, a, just a tremendous, tremendous experience. So and that was my, really my formative days in medical devices. Uh, I was coming in at that level. Yeah, so those early days stepping into an industry that you hadn't experienced before, what were some of those formative experiences that you just, maybe that you can recall right off the bat? Probably one of the biggest things I learned was the importance of the sales force. You know, and that has stuck with me to today. That, you know, it's one thing, you know, I started my career at Procter & Gamble you know, selling to the Walmarts of the world and, and, you know, marketing big brands. And then, you know, a decade at Johnson & Johnson, again, mostly, you know, Tylenol, Motrin, you know, OTC products. And it's one thing, you need a great sales organization to sell to the retailers. But what I realize is medical devices, the sale is completely different. You know, it is so intimate. And it's really a combination, if you know, you know, for those of you who know the industry well, it's really a combination of sales and service. You know, you are taking care of the physicians and taking care of your customers in a completely different way than when you're selling, you know, to mass merchants and, and anything else. And, and I think it was watching the job first that John Brown had done integrating the Halmedica acquisition, which really built the, the main orthopedic business within Stryker, the importance of that sales force. That's what taught me so much in my career that you've got to take care of the sales teams. And I always had in the consumer world, but boy, it's everything in medical devices. You know, it's a great sales team and it's great innovation. And, you know, you put those together and, and good things happen. Yeah. So you spent nine years there. Oh, uh, yep, yeah. almost 10. Almost. Didn't quite make it. Almost 10. So then you went into a, a, an early retirement. Yeah. The board got to me before I got to them. So <laughs> it, uh, and, you know, I just found out you're a prolific golfer. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're in this phase of your career and then Hologic comes calling. Yeah. Um, what about that opportunity excited you? Sure. The, um, you know, I'd been out of striker a little over a year. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Carl Icahn uh, took a 12% stake in Hologic. Um, he was agitating and wanted to break the company up. And the board needed somebody who could, you know, A, try to fix it, and B, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Carl. And um, my, you know, I happened to be available. And uh, <laughs> quite frankly, the, the, the challenge actually excited me. You know, the reality was I wasn't done. Uh, you know, my career at Stryker ended far too early. Uh, I wasn't ready to be retired and playing golf all the time. It's kind of fun. But... At the end of the day, I knew I had a lot more to do. And, and frankly, having Carl involved in Hologic made it more exciting to me mm -hmm. because I realized the stakes, the eyes were going to be on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've got to have the courage to want to go in. It's probably the same idiot in me that was willing to follow John Brown and follow a legend. You know, those are the rules. You never follow a legend. You always follow the person who followed the person, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that followed the legend. And, 
you know, I think with ICON, I actually took it as an exciting challenge and knew all eyes were going to be on it. And, you know, success or failure would be very obvious. Yeah, so you're facing this pretty serious situation. There's a lot of pressure. Um, so, so what were the early days like? Um, the early days were kind of wacky. And um, I will tell you, I think when I got into Hologic, what I realized was going in, first off, the most unbelievable products. You will rarely ever, and I think everybody that I've hired has, has felt it, this company has more differentiated products in leadership positions than virtually any, you know, people who came from J&J, &J, Strike, or whatever else. Every product we're in, you know, we're the undisputed leader. And in many cases, 50, 60, 70% market shares. You know, if you look today in 3D mammography, we have more than 80% market share in the United States. This is going against companies like GE, Siemens, you know, very formidable players. So I saw this company with these incredible market shares, and yet it had activism and icon, and it was just a mess. And what I realized when I got in that I didn't fully understand was the leadership and the employees, there was this enormous gulf and just a, a gaping hole. And the employees who built all those market shares, the innovation and the sales teams that built all these leadership brands were very disconnected from the leadership team. And replace, you know, one or two people and like the Pied Piper, you know, everybody would kind of come along. But it turned out to be almost a complete top, middle and up cultural transformation. I replaced 24 of the top 25 people. Um, and the one that I did not replace has actually just been promoted recently uh, to become our, our new CFO. Um, so she was the one person that, that kind of stayed through the, uh, the turmoil and I saw magic in her. And actually a couple months ago, she just uh, was elevated to CFO. So, but it was a, you know, a complete wholesale cultural transformation that was needed. The other hard part was I was sitting there, Icon wanted to break it up. All the analysts wanted to break the company up. And I came in with a thesis that said, we can grow it. And so I was telling Wall Street and telling Carl and telling everybody else, wait, I think there's these great products we can grow. And then I'd come back in and I'd meet with my leadership team and they'd say, no, Steve, we can't. You know, ah, you know, what do you mean we, we're, we can grow? They just, they lost the growth mindset. And sure enough, in my second year, we grew the top line 9.9%. Uh, so, t you know, call it 10% growth on a big base with no new products. It was all the leaders and the sales forces re-engaging. And then we've you know, gone on to have success from there. But it's back to the products were phenomenal. So you know, I happen to be lucky in you know, getting a company with great products. And I, I fought that going in. I realized they were even stronger, but the cultural gap was even bigger. So when you launch this, this big cultural shift inside Hologic, 24 of the top 25 people are out. How, first of all, how long were you there when you made that move? Um, I fired the head of HR my second day. So I, I started on Monday, I got rid of him on Tuesday and elevated somebody within the organization at that point. Um, and uh, there's, I think Lindsay McGinnis, I think I saw you out there, right? So uh, Lindsay was, was there, one of the, uh, she has subsequently retired from the organization, but she was one of the few people in this room that was there in those early days. I, uh, within about the first three to four months, I'd made a lot of the replacements, and, but ultimately it was probably within about the first 14 months um, is most of them. But I had all the new presidents in place pretty much within the first eight or nine months. Um, and then uh, you know, some other folks within, uh, call it 14 to 15 months in total. So you're, you're filling in all these leadership positions with new faces, new people, maybe promoting within also. Um, how were you, you know, you said you were inspired by the employee base. How were you keeping them inspired during that time and, and assuring them that things were going to be great, this was good for the company? I mean, what were your sort of, what were those conversations like? You know, I tried to be as transparent as I could between town hall meetings and just being out there. I spent a lot of time out, frankly, with the sales teams uh, because they're the ones that are going to carry you through that time period. So I spent a lot of time in the field meeting with 
the sales teams, the sales leadership teams, and making sure that I had their support. And I actually told them at one point, I said, look, you're going to see a lot of change inside. You're going to be reading a lot of organizational changes. Just keep your head down. I need you to deliver for me while I get the inside lined up so we get a better innovation engine for the future. Because what had happened is, even though we had all these great products, the innovation engine had kind of dried up. And so they weren't getting anything new. And I said, it's going to take a couple of years before we can get some new stuff. I need you to deliver while I'm doing that. And ultimately, I think they trusted me. Um, you know, if you see with me, I, you know, I, I try to be pretty straight. I don't, you know, everybody doesn't always love the message, but I think if you're honest with them, um, you know, ultimately they, they believe you and they, and they were looking for leadership. Um, but it was hard, you know, I took out a lot of their, you know, uh, people that have been there for a while. But uh, what was funny as I was getting through the change, I got a number of emails and I'd stop into a couple of mid-level employees offices and, and a number of them would say, keep it up, keep going, you're doing all the right stuff and there's more to be done. Um, and even I'd have, you know, employees come up, you know, come up to me in the cafeteria and, you know, thank me and, and also tell me to keep going, that there was more change that needed to be. They were saying, you're getting there, but there's still a lot of people that need to be weeded out. Um, and it ultimately it did become more about who you add and who you take out. You know, I used to coach my kids' soccer teams, and I, I learned a long time ago, sometimes it's not always who you add, it's who you cut. Um, and I, you know, to use the, the kids' soccer analogy, real simple, right? If you want to give everybody playing time and you're carrying three really weak players on the roster, you have to take away from the good players their playing time. And if you just cut those three, even if you don't add anybody, if you actually cut those three, you've just actually dramatically improved the performance of the team, and some of it was that. This sort of really uh, intense focus on your employee base, listening to those mid-level employees and, and you know, being energized by them, is this a practice that you've tried to maintain throughout your years at Hologic? Very much. You know, it's... Um, you know, whether, whether I'm successful or not, you'd have to ask our, our employee base. But I, I, I'm pretty proud that I feel like I, what I always say, we do an annual en engagement survey, you know, Gallup Q12, for those of you who've, you know, experienced that or whatever. And I always say to my board, if I can't predict how it's going to come out before we do it, then I've lost touch. And I use with what I, I say to my board is the cafeteria test. And I think if you... Just pay attention, walking the halls and talking to people, you know, in the cafeteria. And I feel like they still are willing to come up to me and tell me, you know, whether it's a 20-year veteran or a three-year person or whatever. Um, you know, being able to be candid with you about both progress, but also things that you're not doing as well. Um, then you can usually gauge how that's going to come out. And I, I feel like so far. I've been able to predict, you know, where we've had big upticks, where we'll be flat, and even I try to do it within or within parts of the organization. Okay, that division morale I think is here, operations it's here, the legal group it's here, and I, I try to, in my own mind, before we get the results, outline it, and I and I actually say it publicly to my team so that I'm on the line for what my prediction is, um, and so far I've been pretty close, but uh, you know I think it just it comes down to using, you know, somebody once said to me, God gave you two ears and one mouth. So, you know, you ought to be use it, listening twice as much as you talk. And it's always counter when I'm up here doing this because this is not, <laughs> not my comfortable piece. I'd much rather be listening. So take it away, Sarah. Uh, I want to I I switch. I want to hear more about your life. Yeah. She just got, flipping the got engaged recently, by the way. She studied chemistry in college oh and turned gosh. into journalism. <laughs> so... She's Thanks, now Steve. teaching at the college you <laughs> once went to, and teaching. All right, all right. <laughs> so, oh, so. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit. I think um, I kind of liked that path. Oh, <laughs> that look! You're getting all the the accolades <laughs> and the the humor. You're getting all the applause. Mm, I think uh. it's for you. Um, I think it's a really remarkable time in our history for women, and. Um, 
you know, you can interpret that however you'd like. And Oh, I could have a field day on this one. Yeah. Uh. So, so what I want to, what I'm wondering from you is, what do you see Hologic's role in 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 the the shifting dynamics of of, of women? I see us as possibly being able to play a bigger role than any company on the planet. And let me take a huge step back, and I won't bore you with my life story. But I was raised by a single mom and an older sister. And when I arrived at Stryker, many years later, there were zero women in the top four layers of the company. Incredible company. But I looked at it and I said, my daughter in this environment would never have a chance. And I now have two daughters, one of whom is working, one of whom is still in high school. And I think about everything through being raised by a mom, a single mom, and watching what she dealt with in life, you know, an older sister who played a huge role in my own life, and now as a father of two daughters and a husband, you know, of a woman who's had, you know, her own issues with the healthcare system. And as I look at the healthcare system around the world, I think there are so many, I don't want to say injustices, but so many problems that still so many decisions are made by men. And I think men tend to womenize, minimize issues that are felt by women. Particularly if you start to talk about, you know, postmenopausal women or older women. You know, there are so many things that women experience that the traditional male physician, I believe, has underplayed what the woman is feeling and not understanding as well the physical and the emotional interaction as well with so many things. And so we now, I happen to, you know, it's weird how life goes in these funny fashions. There's no company on the planet that has done more for breast cancer and cervical cancer than Hologic. That is a definitive statement. Our legal group, there's, Lindsay could, <laughs> could justify it out there, right? There's, you know, our predecessor company invented, you know, Thin Prep, the leading pap test. We're making the biggest difference in breast cancer. We can go to governments around the world. And I truly just believe that so much as we look to the future, science can help replace judgment. And particularly in the world of diagnosis, where you, know, you still, too many women, my own mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. Luckily, they caught it early. She's now survived over 20 years, but they caught it early. We all know people that they didn't catch it early. And if you look at things like the USPSTF, that's the United States uh, Services Preventive Task Force, that is frankly trying to say women shouldn't have their first mammogram until they're 50. When, by the way, 26% of all women who die of breast cancer were diagnosed before 50. But they've decided from a population health standpoint that it's more cost effective to wait. By the way, they also haven't looked at the science behind 3D mammography, which is dramatically stronger than 2D. So you have so many decisions being made by men about women's health. And that's in the United States. By the way, you go to the rest of the world. Let's play the Middle East. Let's play Latin America. Let's play Asia. So many of these countries have so long been dominated by male decision makers. And what I love is I think we're coming to a point in the world where, frankly, as more women are getting educated and moving into ultimately decision-making abilities, you know, the ability to start to change that. And I truly believe, and we talk about it within our company, the more successful whole logic is, the more successful women's health will be around the world. And we play such a role, and I think it's, it's something that, that charges up our employees, and it, you know, it, it's truly making a difference in the world, you know, both for patients, but also we're trying to do the same from an employee standpoint as well. Uh, but I really think we can make a difference in this world, even though there's you know, a lot of companies far bigger than us, our single-minded focus on women's health is, I think, unique. Yeah. Sorry, I feel strongly about that. <laughs> it's uh, hard to follow that. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I think one of the things when you talk about women's health is that a, a lot of it, frankly, for a lot of people, it's challenging to discuss. 
It's yes. hard to discuss in a formal setting. It's hard to discuss for women even in a medical setting sometimes. So do you see part of your company's role as inspiring the conversation? Totally. And we are, you know, part of through, we, we've really started to bring marketing and what I'd really call more consumer and physician education to the industry. Uh, so, for example, when we launched our 3D mammography, we've actually brought on Cheryl Crow to be a spokesperson. And, you know, what's wonderful about Cheryl, for those of you who don't know, breast cancer survivor, cares about the technology, you know, and she has helped raise awareness of 3D mammography. Because when you look, you know, if, if there's any women out here, you know, who are still having a 2D mammograms, just real simple terms. Our 3D, by the way, not anybody's 3D, you know, 20 to 65% increase in detecting cancers. And by the way, about a 40-ish percent reduction in false positives. Okay, so it's, you know, it'd be like not using a smartphone, you know, today. You just, you know, the, the technology is so much better. But still, so many people didn't know about it. So we've used Cheryl Crow in that case. We've actually used Aaron Andrews has become a spokesperson for cervical cancer for our cervical cancer screening uh, tests. Um, and I think that's helping to create the dialogue. And we've moved into the medical aesthetic space. And you know what we've seen there is, again, there are so many conditions that you know some people, and I think a lot of men, would downplay as that's not important. For example, you know, being able to help women post-menopause or post-cancer treatments you know, get their sexual health back. Well, that's a big deal. You know, we have no problem approving products like Viagra, but as soon as you start to talk about women's sexual health or sexual function, suddenly it's oftentimes downplayed, well, yeah, yeah, it's just an emotional thing or this or that. No. And if you think about, you know, even recently, and frankly, we take issue with it, the FDA came out very strongly against some of the vaginal rejuvenation products Again, they have no problem with Viagra, but as soon as you start trying to help women in that area, there's a double standard. And so, I, again, I think the more that we are able to get the messages out to physicians, to women, to create that dialogue, you know, women, you know, heavy periods. You know, there's still, there's a ton of women who have hysterectomies just because they have abnormally heavy periods. A hysterectomy is way overkill when you can have a five-minute procedure with one of our products called Novashore. Or there's, you know, there's other competitive products, not nearly as good as ours, of course, but you know, a five-minute procedure with, you know, that doesn't permanently alter the woman's life, which a hysterectomy does. You know, but doctors are so quick, oh, I'll just you know, go to a hysterectomy. Well, it's way overkill. You'd never treat a man that way. You know, somebody told me recently, to, you know, we, we actually brought in a head of R&D for our breast health business. I, I'll give you this analogy. If men had to have mammograms every year, trust me, they'd be more comfortable. Yeah. Think about that. Well, this company is doing something about that. We just introduced something last year called the Smart Curve Paddle. You know, it just, but for years and years, nobody gave a damn about the patient experience of even a mammogram. And there are a lot of things that can be done and, and are in our pipeline for the future to transform that experience as well. But you just have to think about it differently. Yeah, I think um, it was interesting to see you guys step into the medical aesthetic space. It's a space that... Um, One of our yeah. star R&D guys is That's right over right. there, Jim Bull. That's right, uh -huh. Jim Bull. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you guys face as, as a large medical device manufacturer moving into the medical aesthetic space? What are some of the, the hurdles there? Yeah, the biggest thing that uh, what we realized is the sales practices, and I'd say to some degree the sales and marketing practices, were much more aggressive than what we would have ever thought. I think both what I'd call off-label as well as just very aggressive practices. Um, and we believe that we're going to change that over time. Frankly, I think we see more regulation coming, which will help on the off-label side. And we're building a different kind of customer experience over time. It's never easy when you're changing and being a leader in trying to shift practices like that. 
Um, you know, I dealt with it before, frankly, early in my years at Stryker when the medical device and when the orthopedics industry was looked at by the Department of Justice um, and ultimately ended up changing the sales and marketing practices there uh, when my good friend Chris Christie, who was then the U.S. Attorney uh, for the state of New Jersey, had looked into the orthopedic industry. Ultimately, I believe that, you know, as regulation comes to these industries, the better run companies, and, and you know, we use the analogy, if there's a referee on the field, um, then the better team wins. And so what we actually see happening in the medical aesthetics industry here over the next few years is frankly a raising of the bar of the standards, and that will play to our strength. It's been harder to adjust in the very early time, but at the end of the day, what's gonna prevail there is exactly in everything else. The best products with the best customer support and sales teams win. Mm -hmm. And that's what we will bring to that industry. So, so Right, Jen? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, when, when you're considering an acquisition, Cologic has made several, when you're considering an acquisition, how do you differentiate between sort of that healthy tension that exists? Do you buy or build internally? Sure. You know, at the core, I always believe more of our growth um, will come from the internal organic innovation engine. You know, that, 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 that's going to be what drives. And, and we've got, you know, so many great scientists and so many great R&D people. But occasionally you have to supplement that. Um, we've done a little bit of that in the breast health business, you know, because you never see everything. So I think the key is when your scientists feel like, hey, there's enough being invested internally, and you also engage them a little bit on the external process as well, because I also believe sometimes just you know paying attention to what else is going on out there also is a good catalyst to your own thinking to avoid groupthink. But it, it is it's always a balance, and you know I think it's it's like everything it's a combination of art and science. And I think the big piece is if you're you know excited about the internal programs, and ideally you know it's where ultimately I say growth solves everything. If you're growing fast enough, you can spend more in R and D every year and you can do external acquisitions. It's companies that aren't growing is when you start to get into, I think that trade-off is worse because then you're having to cut. You know, if you're a company that's going down, you're making trade-offs between internal or external. If you're growing, you can spend more every year in R&D and you can supplement on the outside. So my simple answer to everything is growth. Growth <laughs> solves everything. I have real simple answers to everything. Uh, <laughs> so we've heard you talk a little bit about 3D mammography as a technology that you guys are really excited about. Uh, what are some of the other growth drivers for the company? It sounds like moving more into some international markets is on the horizon for you guys. Tell us a little bit about what's going on. Sure. You know, the, clearly our 3D mammography has been, you know, such a great linchpin. But what's fascinating is, as you see with all technologies, sometimes they lead to other opportunities that you didn't expect. And so what we found, you know, particularly in the case of our 3D mammography, we're finding so many cancers much earlier in the life cycle. So instead of finding somebody at stage three, we're finding them at stage zero, stage one. Well, what that also then results in, for example, the number of mastectomies occurring should be going down, but the number of lumpectomies or you know very early stage stuff coming up. So it's actually creating a newer category now what we're calling breast conserving surgery. So we're taking our presence in diagnostics and realizing we're revolutionizing, you know, ideally if we're, you know, super successful and catch everything early, you know, the need for true, you know, mastectomies can go down, you know, dramatically and you can do much more microscopic, you know, surgeries. So now getting into effectively things like, you know, localization treatments and other stuff. So it's creating sort of a continuum as we, you know, go through the biopsy stage and, and, and some of that. You know, then on, you know, basically our reproductive health side, um, you know, what used to be known as kind of sexually transmitted infection, you know, we're the world leader in, you know, STI detection and, you know, all these great things, chlamydia, gonorrhea, all these great things to talk about over dinner. I'm glad most of you have finished. Bless you, by the way. Um, and, you know, as well as, you know, cervical cancer and, and you know, the pap test, everything else that we have. Uh, but, you know, you realize there are so many opportunities, particularly it's not just about detecting, 
you know, the sexually transmitted infections, but there's all kinds of knock-on effects that, you know, really can af affect the whole reproductive mechanism. So I think as we look at our molecular business, that diagnostics business, tremendous opportunity, and again, internationally, as you said, as well. So, you know, every opportunity, it seems like just to open up more along the way, just as our surgical business led us to the medical aesthetic space, and then as, you know, we start to see that, we start to see overlaps, you know, with some of our other businesses. But, you know, it's just being in each area, kind of open your eyes to others. What are some of the challenges that you guys are experiencing or you expect to experience as you try to grow internationally? I think the, the biggest wake-up call for me, um, and, you know, as we referenced earlier, I hired a bunch of people up front. None of us are perfect. Um, I had misdiagnosed the situation internationally. I thought it was a turnaround. And then when I started to spend more time internationally, I realized it's actually a startup. Uh, we were so underdeveloped. So part of the big piece has been putting just the attracting great leaders in what's been relatively small businesses there. And, you know, my first piece, I didn't necessarily get it right. The second generation of leaders were brought in, just phenomenal. But being able to then build out the relationships with, frankly, the governments around the world. Because, again, we had no government affairs. We basically went through distributors. Well, distributors are basically just, you know, putting your product in a catalog. They're selling it. They're not thinking about how to form policy. You know, we can now walk into Japan and talk to the MHLW or Germany, you know, wherever it might be, and talk to the governments about, for relatively small investments in health, they can have a massive impact on two of the most important areas of women's health, cervical cancer, breast cancer. And, you know, frankly, so that ability to build the government affairs piece and, and attract the salespeople and shifting from going through distributors to actually having our own direct employees, you know, so it's really been, you know, not the sexy stuff. It's blocking, tackling, it's heavy work, uh, but it's paying off and building a really strong, you know, capability and one that's got a ton of runway uh, for us in the future. Yeah, so, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the policy issues that I think the, the med tech industry is grappling with. One of those um, being manufacturing and trade. Um, you actually spent some time on the U.S. Manufacturing Council under President, former President Barack Obama. Can you tell me a little bit about how that experience came about for you? Sure. It was, uh, I was recommended, it was, a, it was a pretty cool council. It had, you know, Bill Weldon from J&J, &J, the CEOs of, you know, Intel, Corning, uh, Honeywell, you know, a lot of the bigger company. I was probably, Stryker was probably the smallest company represented there. Uh, but I've had a long commitment to really producing in the United States. Um, and we had just built a plant in Kalamazoo, Michigan. We were expanding our medical beds and stretchers. Every time, uh, it, it's true, every time you see any sporting event, any TV show, when you see that yellow, um, you know, the yellow gurney brought out, you know, that's always a strike about every one of those in the world is made in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And um, I believed at the time, and I continue to believe, particularly in healthcare, that you want to be careful outsourcing a lot of manufacturing around the world, um, you know, to just, just to cut costs. Now, by the way, you know, as we all know, we've got, you know, plants all over the world. And, you know, I mean, you just look at places like Ireland, Switzerland that are tremendous hubs of manufacturing for medical devices and, and med tech. Um, but we had, you know, a deep base there. And so when, you know, President Obama was trying to pretend that he wanted to listen to business people, um, he reached out and formed this council. And, uh, and I was on that. By the way, I'm a bigger fan of him than some other folks that might be around and that could get us totally off. I, uh, I would take him in a heartbeat right now. Um, although I don't think they, I don't think that administration listened to business enough. And I think it's part of what created the, you know, the, 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 the shift this time. But, you know, I think that was key. And frankly, even at Hologic, uh, I am incredibly proud. And we had looked, I was under tremendous pressure early in my tenure to move our manufacturing. When you had, we had Carl Icahn, we also had relational investors. Everybody wanted to move our San Diego facility. They wanted to move it to Tijuana and they wanted to take our breast health business, you know, move it to Mexico. Um, 
Candidly, we still produce every mammography machine in the world that we make is made in Danbury, Connecticut and Newark, Delaware. So they're all made in the United States and shipped around the world. Um, and I'm very proud of that. And we have, you know, I will tell you, you know, I took a ton of heat from Wall Street for not moving faster. I will say the tax change that, that came into effect um, has benefited us and benefited us well, but because of that, and, and I think it's why that particular corporate tax change, I think it was absolutely the right thing for this country. And it is, you know, we would have probably ultimately, despite my not wanting to move the production, you know, it would have been relentless. And at some point we probably would have, you know, moved, moved there. But I'm really proud that, you know, we were able to keep our teams. And, and again, because quality is just so crazy. You know, it, what people that don't understand medical device, it, it's so easy to move manufacture. If you're making you know, widgets or, you know, just standard machinery, you can move that stuff around the world. You know, you move it to China and then frankly, Vietnam comes up and they can do it cheaper or Malaysia comes up. You just keep moving your plants. You know, when you're in a regulated industry and you care about quality, you want to be very careful just moving things around like that. And, you know, it has served us, you know, in my career, I've always been slow on moving a lot of manufacturing and ultimately I think it has always paid off, um, you know, really well. And, you know, both companies, both the major companies I've run have had a disproportionately large U.S. manufacturing footprint. And it's, I think it's worked out okay. So I want to make sure there's enough time for just a couple of questions from the audience. Um, we should have somebody with a floating microphone. If you have a question that you want to ask, Steve, just pop your hand up and we'll, we'll get a mic over to you. Any questions? I've got some more. <laughs> All right, well, we'll keep the microphone. If you think of a question, just pop your hand up. Steve, um, no, oh. yeah. <laughs> um, looking ahead, reflecting on your career and you know the issues that we just discussed about policy, what do you see as sort of the pressing issues for the medtech industry? We have a crowd of folks within the industry, uh, companies big and small, what, what should they be paying attention to? Yeah, I, I think innovation is always going to be the lifeblood of this industry. I think part of what I love about both the diagnostic side of the business as well as you know the, the, the core device side of the business, I continue to believe we're having such an enormous impact on human health, you know, and and for me, you know, what I've always loved. Somehow, I ended up. I started my career at Procter and Gamble, and then I ended up at J and J, and that taught me about healthcare. And and to me, you know, finding this love of business and healthcare together um, is great because I think we can all wake up every day knowing we're going to work for companies that are making a difference on this planet. You know, we're not just selling. You know, nothing against potato chips and soda and other stuff. But, you know, there's something very different when you meet somebody who, you know, you have changed their life. And, um, you know, so I think that keeping that innovation engine is critical. I do think being mindful of cost, you know, as governments around the world, um, you know, are pressured and, and with population growth. And even in the United States, when healthcare is eating up 17 or 18 percent of our, you know, gross domestic product, you know, the cost of healthcare is going to be big. So I think the ability to both innovate, but also innovate in more cost effective manners for the future um, will be, you know, is, is a great place to be. And I think there's so much, you know, so many of the companies in this space, you know, you think about, you know, just so much of the minimally invasive surgery or, you know, devices in cardiac care and, you know, instead of having to do, you know, open heart surgery, being able to, you know, go up through the the veins and the artery, you know, different things, you know, there, there, there's so much exciting stuff going on in this industry. And, you know, I just, I, I, I think it's the greatest industry on earth. Any questions for Steve? We've got it. one back here. Hi, Steve. Thanks so much. This has been really uh, interesting to listen to. And I really would love to hear 
So you talked a lot about women's health. You've hit all the big points, and you're talking a lot about women in med tech. So what kind of things are you doing internally to kind of help women develop that presence and that industry perspective? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I go a little counter to much of the perceived HR trends in the industry. So I'll, I'll, I'll possibly get myself on a limb here. But what I would say is judge me by my actions, not words. And it was interviewed recently. First off, we have over 40% of our board of directors are women. Uh, I was interviewed last year by one of the, the leading magazines that was wanting to, to talk about this. And like, well, you know, what have you done? You know, quote, what I said is real simple. I find the best people. And I think there's been so much done, you know, all these, you know, dare I say, women's networks and quotas and numbers. What I've tried to do is create an environment where we're just creating a true meritocracy. And if you even look at whole logic, when I walked in the door, all the direct reports of the CEO were men. Now we have, you know, Several on my global leadership team. We have three women on the global leadership team. Just promoted a woman to become the CFO. Um, and I will tell you, you know, I even watched the inherent biases in some of that as we had discussions with our board. Well, shouldn't we look outside? Well, guess what? She's more qualified than the guy that I hired, you know, when I first came in. Um, and you have to have those discussions. And then within our commercial organization, we now have a pipeline of women coming through, just promoted one into the, the highest VP of sales role in our breast health business, our largest division. By the way, this is a woman that was running sales operations and had about six people reporting to her five years ago. Um, she actually quit the company my first week on the job. Um, I saw that she was good and we invested in her, and through no quotas, we've given her some opportunities. She's thrived in every role. And I just, I still do believe that so much of it is having the courage to go ahead and give women. I think there are so many inherent biases from men that when you line people up, you know, it, it's like people will say if you, you know, for those of you who do the NCAA brackets, if you look at people's records, and take the brand name, the team off of it, so you don't have Duke or Kentucky, you just look at the resume of that year, it looks very different. But people are always biased by the name. I believe the same thing happens between men and women. And we are so often unwilling to take the chance on what we just made this one VP of sales for a breast health business. 18 months ago, she'd never had a sales job in her life. She's now, and by the way, when we just promoted her two months ago, the whole organization wanted it because she'd already earned the respect in a role that we put her in previously. And so it's creating the opportunities, and I do it through very deep involvement and managing people's careers. We now have, you know, it, actually, I just said this to our board last week, four out of the five commercial roles, not staff roles, four of the five senior commercial roles that we have filled in the last year, so this is VPs of sales, VPs of marketing, have been women or minorities. In our particular case, it's three women, one African-American male, and one white male. Five major commercial roles in the last year. So, Because what I also think is so many women have been pushed into staff roles over the years, and we, you know, dare I say, we check the box by putting women into, you know, chief diversity officer, you know, all this kind of stuff, instead of the meaningful roles. And when I retire from whole logic, it will be a very different place. We have, you know, right now, women slated to be running our biggest businesses in the next few years. And, you know, that's from nothing, you know, five years ago. And it, it takes time, but it, what it really takes is active management, but I fiercely, fiercely believe it's not by setting a quota or anything else, because, and you can challenge me on this, but I've said it all along, when every woman gets promoted or any minority gets a role, if you've been out there saying this is our goal, 
I think people look askance and question, did that person get the role because they're a woman or a minority? And I'm really proud that in our organization, those questions aren't asked. Everybody that's getting promoted, it's very obvious they got the role because they are the best. And it's a true, if you play a true meritocracy, then you win. And that's how we're doing it quietly, if you see. We're not out there preaching everything, but I'd put our track record right now up against any major company in America for what's happening at that you know, critical feeding level, which is the people right below the presidents. And you know, really proud. And, and I think it's our responsibility and, and obligation. But we've, and we've both found it by bringing people in from the outside. We've also found a lot of great people who are in the organization and given them the chances. Sorry, it's another area I feel really passionate about, in case you can. Now, the guy in the back who thought he was getting called on before, but yes. So. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a, a very interesting talk. I enjoyed the discussion. You mentioned, you know, lightly how an administration can help or hinder um, maybe the med device uh, industry. I'm curious as to what your opinion is. What's the next thing that needs to be tackled? What's, what's the biggest hindrance to... Uh, the med device industry, specifically in this country, as the FDA um, and the regulatory bodies, um, you know, are are a big deal around the world, um, even if we're not selling outside this country. Yeah, I I think with the FDA, it really is trying to keep up with the technology. My big fear with FDA is when you look at the pace of innovation in the companies and the quality of the scientists and R&D people that we have on our teams, the FDA's ability to keep up with that is really hard because we're hiring the best and the brightest. Industry is paying far more than what they can get. And I worry that you, you, you can slow the industry down. And let's face it, you know, most, country, most companies now, you're getting stuff approved in Europe way before you get it approved in the US because the FDA is, is playing a little older. I also think you know, we want to be careful that the FDA doesn't get politicized. Um, you know, in this current environment, you know, always a little bit of a concern. But I think you know, the FDA, I, I look at it as there are so many incredibly well-intentioned people. And you know, every time I meet with them, you meet with them, you know, there's nobody down there that doesn't want to do the right thing, which is advance human health and watch out for its safety. But the sheer amount of volume, and it's where things like, and I was involved in the original, you know, Medufa, and, and where industry is kicking in to help, you know, fund additional, you know, staff down at FDA, because I think that benefits us all. And I think, again, you know, you look at the, the massive amount of R&D spend in the industry, the number of great scientists we have, for the FDA to keep up with that, it's not easy. And so it's trying to find the right levels of being able to use 510Ks, use PMA, you know, use the right processes to ensure safety. You know, safety's always got to come first, but also allow that innovation to move forward. We have time for maybe one more question, if there is one. No, oh, back here. Um, I had a question about innovation. So you mentioned that when you stepped in as CEO, you were missing the pipeline of innovation. The focus was let's keep selling what we got. And now when you look at the Ford pipeline, how do you bridge that gap between you know venture capital always looking to step in later and later in the growth trajectory and this kind of funding gap that comes from early innovation and bridging the gap through clinical trials to start proving the model? And how are you guys thinking about that as a company? And you know, scouting new technologies. Sure, I think the, uh, you know, in our particular case, part of what led Carl Icahn to get involved with Hologic was the focus had turned so much to acquiring companies instead of, even though the company had been built on, on good technologies, it, it turned into acquiring. And we had lost the muscle to innovate inside. And I think ultimately the healthiest companies are ones that have you know, what I'd call a full mosaic of you want internal innovation. And that internal innovation should be some stuff that's 
you know, very much incremental in nature, right? That what I'd call the singles, you know, if you use a baseball analogy, Red Sox are playing tonight, right? But, um, you know, if you just some basic product upgrades, product enhancements, you know, you need, you know, some of your resources just devoted to keeping your existing products getting better. But you also want, you know, something that's more significant. You know, in the case of our mammography, you don't come out with 3D mammography by tweaking 2D. It's completely different technology. So you need to have some scientists and R&D and marketing people thinking about that longer term future. But it can't be all that. You know, we've all heard, you know, every R&D person that will come to you and say, hey, just invest more for the, you know, next year and you'll get it, you know, three years out. Well, back to business, we have to do a bit of both. So it's having an internal pipeline that both has short, medium, long-term things, almost by business. And then the same really scouting business development deals. You know, you can't do all early stage deals that, you know, are, you know, highly dilutive and, and you know, you're, you're betting on the come and, you know, you won't get any revenue for three to five years, whatever. But if you do all late stage stuff, you're paying up. So again, it's, it's really finding a portfolio, you know, and, you know, different than obviously VC portfolios, but the thinking, you know, a little bit similar that, you know, some early stage stuff, some late stage stuff, um, you can't have all your eggs in one basket. And clearly, you know, I think one of the, as companies have gotten bigger, gives you, you know, more even divisional areas to be able to place bets on. Um, So the, the more categories that you're in, you know, it cuts both ways because you can spread your resources too thin, but it also gives you different places to be able to place those bets. So, you know, ultimately when I think about our whole, both R&D as well as acquisitions, it's thinking what do we have in all of those early, mid, late stage buckets across the various businesses. So hopefully that addressed it. Um, Great. Steve, I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, We really appreciate you being here. Let's hear it for Steve, everybody. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.